point being is it's a tremendous amount of debt. And uh, I don't know if uh, Paul Ryan, but, uh, a friend of mine, was sort of on the budget committee with him. We were talking about the budget the last couple of years. By the way, the U.S. House of Representatives has actually passed the budget in Washington. But it's been more than 1,200 days since the U.S. Senate. 1,200 days since they actually passed the budget. How, how about you run a business? You went to your bank and said, by the way, I want to borrow some money, a few billion dollars, but I have no budget. And I don't plan on having a budget. And my name is Harry Reid. I've announced I plan on not passing a budget. You wouldn't get the money. But every day, your federal government in Washington, for three and a half years in a row now, has borrowed three and a half billion dollars every single day on average. Three and a half billion for three and a half years. And uh, this is where I disagree with President on a number of things. And uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, the head of the Federal Reserve, they honestly believe, and I'll get I'll say, I'll say they really believe this, they believe we can continue to borrow forever. Now that's an economic philosophy I, I, I think it's a scale again and again. It isn't that they don't want to do away with it, but they honestly believe in their economic world that we can continue to borrow forever. Because as you know, we are the reserve currency of the world. And that's the argument from Mr. Dyer. That's the argument from Mr. Bernanke. That's, the, that's why we heard Mr. Bernanke saying QE3 is going to start. It just happens to be 63 days before the election that it's going to start. But they honestly believe that if they print more money and spend more money, eventually regulate more, that will grow the economy. And uh, I know some folks think, well, it's, uh, I think, well, I'm not gonna give you credit for those beliefs that they, they're really trying to tear down the country. I know there's that thought out of it. But there's honestly people who lead in Washington. For instance, in the president's budget, which he submitted to Congress, I give him credit, he submitted one this year. And he submits one every year as required. His budget submitted this year will not balance for 75 years. I am not kidding. Now, if you go to states where it's really in play of who they're going to vote for in the election, you'll see an advertisement that says the president has a plan to reduce the debt. Ladies and gentlemen, the basic principle, if you're running a deficit, you can never reduce the debt. And for 75 years, well, what happens in year 76? They only count for 75 years in Washington. And uh, so that's not ever, ever balanced for a single year. For the next 75, but they're running ads that tell American people, I've got a plan. But your plan that didn't balance for 75 years, didn't get a single vote in the House, you didn't get one in the Senate either. And, but I, I want to be clear with you, though, I, I know some folks have called since, hey, Tim, we're running, a, we want to balance our budget, and we want to do it next year. Or maybe the year after that. Well, when you're borrowing 41 cents out of every dollar, I'll be straight, we can't, we can't balance that. We can't balance the following year. We have, unfortunately, can we get there? It depends how quickly the American people are willing to reduce the level of spending. And I, I offered a, a budget amendment on the floor of the U.S. House as an amendment to what did pass in the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan's budget. The amendment to that, to his budget, would have balanced him based, based on the assumptions anywhere from seven to nine years. You probably, oh my gosh, we can't wait seven to nine years. That was as far as we could screw it down and think we maybe have the votes to get passed. And so the budget that finally did pass in Washington, D.C., on the House side, again, the Senate never had one, does not balance for, I think, 26 years. Yeah. Folks, that was my choice uh, that particular day in the U.S. House. But I voted for seven, nine years. 26 years are never balanced out. And the radical choice that were reported to, to mainstream media was balancing in 26 years is not doable. Folks, we don't have, I don't believe we have 26 years balance. I'm thinking we have much less than that. And that's what scares you. Because I do hear from economists that, that sound sensible, and they'll look me in the eye, and, and some of them conservative, some of them liberal, and they say, Tim, if we're talking, we maybe we have a few years. Maybe we have less than a year. I don't know what the answer is. But all I know is it's not 26 years, it's not 75 years, and I don't think we have 10 years to get a fiscal house vote. When you're running 1.3 trillion, today the NASA has that so far this fiscal year is 1.21 trillion dollars. We're going to borrow, they're only going to spend three and a half trillion, they've already borrowed 1.2 trillion, and they're not to the end of the year yet. This has been going on. You know, back when they were talking about how big uh, the deficits were, they were really going after the former president, and, and rightly so, and it's monstrous, they have a monstrous debt of 
662 buildings. That was the death of the in the last three or four years. And we've continued to go down and down to the site. And uh, as we, we go forward, and, uh, and I've had an opportunity to visit with uh, the folks that, that work for one of the presidential candidates anyway, pretty closely. And they recognize that we have a very short window to put us on the trajectory to get our fiscal house in order. Or else we won't be calling our shots. We'll be like Spain waking up one morning. But like Greece waking up one morning where, where it's, you don't make different calls. And we're getting very close to that. And I think uh, maybe I uh, offered the story to you. Uh, last time I mentioned with you, and I apologize if I repeat that, but it's uh, for a small kid from a little town of Fowler, Kansas, uh, sitting in a room with the fifth highest ranking official from China. Fifth highest ranking official. They're telling me this is what you're going to do with your budget, or we're not going to loan you money anymore. That's pretty scary. And we're able to write down and say, you know, we may or may not do that. But uh, there will be a point in the future, a point in time, where we will lose control of our country. We will have our policies dictated by somebody outside the United States. It's one thing to fight over here in this country, but to have our creditors, but you know what? That's, that's not good. Enough. And we see that in other nations. Right now, we're operating on the good graces of what is the reserve currency. But the reserve currency is devalued every single day. Mr. Bernanke runs the French prices. And QE3 is exactly that. To continue to print money, to hopefully believe in that possibility is that if Uncle Sam spends the money, he's going to actually create more economic activity than if uh, any business in Hutchison did. That's the philosophy. That's the theory. It, it, they tried it in the 30s. You know, they took what was an economic recession and made it into the worst depression in the history of our country. And we were the only country in the world going through this long-term depression. They've taken the same philosophy, that same theory, and now applying the policy of debt. And at the end of the day, you end up with $60 trillion in debt. You have 23 million Americans that are either unemployed or underemployed or looking for work. And that's the thing. I, I told Mr. Benaki, I said, you yeah, know, we can talk about quarter points and growth and you promised we'll never get under 8% unemployment. It's never, it would always be under 8%. It's never been below 8% since your stimulus package. But I said, Mr. Bernanke, those are just numbers. But the real is there's 23 million American families that are out of job or looking for more work because that policy failed. That policy failed. We wish it would have succeeded. We wish it would have worked. I didn't think it would. And, uh, the Obama administration promises that it would work in the past. And as we move forward to talk about that, and hopefully as we look back in the past, and uh, we'll hopefully remember what, what did it, it did work. And I think there's always this open you see it, folks coming to Washington, and I appreciate that. But gosh, if you can, if you would do just this one thing, you know, it'd be amazing all the jobs that we create. And I just say, hey, wait a minute, I talked to small businessmen and women in Hutchinson all across the first district, actually all across the uh, the United States of America, what they're saying is, we don't want you help them. We want you to leave us alone. We're tired of new regulations. We're tired of taxes. We're tired of the uncertainty of the health care plan. And by the way, don't be fooled. I'm going to talk about Obamacare here. And by the way, I think there's some media here that's jumped on me recently because I actually said the word Obamacare. With all due respect, the president also calls it Obamacare. And it's your signature legislation. Hopefully you'll talk about it all the way through your convention. But the truth of the matter is, if you plan to be on Medicare or you're on Medicare now, Obamacare raised $716 billion out of Medicare to fund Obamacare. $716 billion. Because they couldn't pay for it. It was a tax increase to take it. And it's coming in all the way. Yes, it's already increased before they even started the program. But if you're worried about Medicare, Obamacare is higher than future Medicare. Is if we do not refill Obamacare, Medicare can be bankrupt in this U.S. I think the latest figures might be nine years. Who in here would plan on living more than nine years? <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, if you are not planning on living more than nine years, I would suggest the end of the year might be a good uh, target to look at. <laughs> because if you die before the end of the year, you will not face a 55% death tax. At the end of the year, nothing happens in Washington this year. And you die, 55% of your estate up to a million dollar exemption will go down the same. 55%. In Washington, this will 
million dollars, that sounds like a lot. Unless you, you farm for a living or just have a small business or actually invest it, a million dollars is not much. And uh, it goes up to 55 percent. And if your income taxes will go up, your dividend taxes will go up, your, your estate, you know, everything's going to go up day to year. And one, one thing to recall as we talk tonight is there will be an election. There will be an election in 63 days. America will make its decision. But no matter what happens, I will be serving in a lame duck Congress until January 2nd. And in my view, it's true of opinion. I think there will be a lame duck president. That will be the call of the American people. So once we have the vote in November, in uh, nine weeks from now, you've got uh, Washington running free for about two months. I'm pretty scared about that, especially on the regulatory side. You know, I have uh, my background farming range. If I wasn't in politics, and uh, the home cut corn for the first day today, and I, I'm sitting here visiting with you tonight. I really appreciate it. <laughs> but for a farm kid, I'd like to be on that front line. That's where I would be. But uh, there's numerous regulations that this administration is holding back and have announced. For instance, the regulation of farm dust. You know, let's make a rain, we'll take care of farm dust. Uh, that, that regulation they're proposing, they might change that in December. Trust me, they're not going to reduce regulations on that. There's numerous other things that will happen after the election, no matter the results, that will impact us in the regulatory environment. That's a few things I want to talk to you about. I know you have a lot of questions, and uh, whether it's about policy, whether it's about anything else. I did, as, as was mentioned, at the convention last, uh, last week with my wife. And uh, let me tell you, uh, my impression of, uh, of uh, Mitt Romney and, and Paul Ryan, I'll say, Mitt Romney probably wasn't my favorite, but when he picked uh, Paul Ryan, what Mitt Romney has demonstrated to me is that it's not just about winning the election. It's about what are we going to do next year and the year after that. And I've had conversations on the phone in person, uh, many of those with, with Paul Ryan. One of those I remember, he's, he's about my age, just a little bit younger. Uh, he's got three kids, I think, under 12. I've got four kids under 16. And when we have conversations, I talk to Paul Ryan. It's, it's not about next year. It's not about next week. It's not about the next, next uh, couple of years. About the next generation. And that's the theme I think we should talk about. What are we going to do? What am I going to do? What are you going to do to make sure that the American, and I think it's slipping away. You look at the numbers, it's slipping. The American that we were given, that we were blessed what are we doing to make sure that we have that kind of gift to hand on to our children and grandchildren? Without a doubt, it is truly a gift to God that we can grant here. And I want to make sure we have one.